Hello, this is Mark Mitchell. Today we're going to be looking at Chapter 6. Chapter 6 is about socialization. And so uh, we see here at the, the first slide after the introduction where we're going to be today. We're going to start with the agents of socialization and then go on to socialization through the life course on down to uh, forming an identity in the digital world. So lots of topics here. Uh, for the for the chapter, so let's go ahead and get started. As usual, our author lists some additional articles uh, there that relate to all the material that we just saw on the previous slide. Uh, usually, three articles there that contain within the the text or the e-text, whichever one you may have. When we start the chapter, we need to start with a definition of socialization, and that's where our, our book starts and uh, also includes the agents of socialization. But generally speaking, socialization is that lifelong process from birth until death in which people develop their abilities, um, and they do that through their culture. And then, of course, our book also adds in uh, norms, values, beliefs, and behaviors, which uh, really does talk about the components of culture. But it's really developing your potential as a person, and it's kind of like a plant that needs, you know, real good soil and nutrients to realize its full potential to be all it can be. Uh, maybe another way to say that, and you know, usually that happens for most uh, people, or at least they get a good deal of that. And then our book also addresses, well, what if you didn't get any of that, say, good soil to develop? What would happen to you as a person uh, in that regard? And the agents of socialization, uh, we have several, but they're just uh, like our book suggests, but it's uh, the, the ways that we do develop as people uh, that are there to help us make sure we reach our full potential. So the next slide uh, starts with the most important agent of socialization, and that is family. Because you spend the most time uh, in a family, and uh, there's... Lots of uh, social rules that you learn, for example, to say thank you, uh, respect your elders, uh, don't hit anybody. Uh, our book also mentions a study by Melvin Cohn uh, there from the late 70s and just really shows the difference um, in middle class parents versus working class parents and what parents try to impart to their children. Um, for working class children, really parents just teach them to follow the rules. Uh, and then uh, other parents, for example, when they get uh, higher than middle class parents, you know, they really teach them different lessons about what to expect as these children get older and you know uh, get more adult-like responsibilities in life. But they, they really teach their children what they have experienced in order to help them. That's the, the goal. Uh, we also, our book mentions there are a difference in cultural differences between parenting. And so um, in terms of like when children start to walk or how long they're breastfed, uh, there's different uh, types of things there. Uh, we mentioned there already about the working class and middle class parents, but, you know, parenting styles such as uh, whether the parents are authoritarian or more democratic or hands off or laissez faire. Those would also be maybe some differences that you could look at. Another agent of socialization is school. Uh, so again, uh, children are learning uh, role-appropriate behavior, and they're also getting used to adult roles uh, for the work world, for example. You know, school, a lot of it mimics what you'll see in the work world, that you'll be in there for 50 or 60 or so years. There's also... Uh, the regular lessons you learn, the reading, writing, and arithmetic, uh, or the three R's. And then the hidden curriculum is more about the social order that uh, school students are taught to reproduce uh, generation after generation. Uh, our book lists the media, and there's really some interesting information contained in the text about the media usage per day, and it is rather large, but uh, you know, despite school for young people, our book estimates that uh, teenagers, uh, children 13 to 18, uh, despite the school day, spend nine hours a day with media, whereas eight to 12 year olds spend about six hours a day. So say if you spend eight hours a day in school and then nine hours with media, that's 17 of your 24 hours. So you really uh, don't have much time left over 
it just shows how involved you are. I know um, I use media a lot. I use the internet a lot just about every day, and I, I think I would probably be, be lost without it, um, either for work purposes or, you know, my self-interest when I look at things not related to work. Okay, but um, the, uh, we do live in a consumer-oriented society. Our book continues with that, and so there's uh, so many <clears throat> options when it comes to media, and they teach so many messages. Um, I know I've had uh, a book before, but uh, it really talked about in media how it was filled with sexual imagery and talk, and so the point there was you know, parents better talk to their children about these topics or else, of course, the media will, and I'm sure you can think of TV shows and movies and uh, song lyrics that are uh, very graphic in terms of sexual content that uh, young viewers are uh, taking in every day. Uh, our book also mentions that, uh, for example, in the movie industry, that uh, a lot of foreign countries, they import more films that are made from the United States than maybe they make themselves, you know. Uh, one statistic says almost about two-thirds. In some countries, uh, U.S. movies really make up what's imported there in uh, Europe. All right, but uh, we can definitely see uh, such a, a heavy media saturation as compared to in the past. Uh, if you have a copy of the book, you can see a, a picture of that on, on 127. There's quite a bit of change there over a number of decades. Moving on, we see the peer groups, and those are people of uh, like age, interest, and abilities. And so uh, that's also a very important source of uh, socialization. It's the first time you kind of meet with people that are uh, like you that uh, maybe you want to know further. But as opposed to being around your parents, your parents have power over you. And it's really kind of a different situation with your, your peer group. All right, but uh, our book shows both good and bad examples uh, with peer groups. Uh, for example, there's a gang, and you can see how they have different colors and signs and gestures. Well, that's not unlike what you might find with fraternities or sororities, except they're seen as a, a positive example, whereas gangs are seen as a negative example. The workplace, that may not be uh, one agent of socialization you might normally think of, but it is listed as well, but your employer for example, tries to get you to uh, behave in a certain way, uh, maybe on the job in terms of interaction with customers or other employees or even with uh, the person who's considered the boss. Our book is an example of uh, law students at Harvard whose initial interest in the field of law was due to they wanted to help uh, people and had a strong interest in the law itself. But, you know, after they had been in law school for a few years, they had kind of changed their thinking to where they wanted to just be a uh, law professional that made a lot of money and not really interested in, in public uh, defense cases. All right. And maybe one other surprising agent of socialization was religion. And uh, there you can think of all the different religions are in the world, but they really are uh, a list of do's and don'ts that tells you what type of behavior is acceptable and unacceptable according uh, to different religious figures. And uh, our book just, for example, lists two, the two largest religions in the world today, and that would be Christianity and Islam. But uh, uh, I think our book is right. Uh, we could also add, uh, we've already mentioned the workplace, but you know, really when we talk about different nations of the world, they socialize us too. Now, a lot of those rules come from our, our family and parents, uh, but I would call that civil religion. Now, that's not listed in our, our book or our slides, but uh, I think there's not a whole lot of difference in that and uh, the other, other form of religion that's listed in our book. All right, uh, moving on, when we talk about uh, still with the agents of socialization, our book mentions total institutions. So uh, sometimes there are some places that really have a lot of control over people, and that's because uh, you live there, uh, such as a boarding school or a mil military-type school. And when you have somebody around you 24-7 and you do have authority over them, you can uh, change their behavior. And I think that's what our book is really referring to. Irving Goffman, a name we've encountered before, uh, he is 
listed here with the total institutions. Some of these are by choice, and then some of these are, are um, not by choice. But, for example, when socialization does not go normally or, or correctly and it's in need of some type of, of fix, that may be why somebody is enrolled in a total institution. Or it could be, uh, for example, they're sick and they need some help, or uh, their behavior just isn't what it should be. Uh, sometimes people join these things of free will, such as a monastery and convent, or maybe uh, the military schools or military itself. And so those would be a couple other examples. But that re-socialization is stripping away uh, former identities and building up a new one. And that is possible with these total institutions. All right, our book switches gear to the next topic, and that's socialization through the life course. And uh, remember, our definition of socialization did incorporate that lifelong process. And so you can see that in the first term here. But that life course perspective says, you know, from a young age to an old age, there's all sorts of influences that we're going to encounter uh, that make an impression or influence on us. Some of those are rites of passage, and it marks uh, a lot of times uh, the change from a child to an adult. So it could be uh, the Jewish bar mitzvah or the quinceanera, where a young man or a young lady uh, actually becomes considered an adult with the rights and privileges uh, that go along with being an adult uh, from a child. Anticipatory socialization is when, hey, maybe there's a, a club that we want to be a part of or a profession or something like that. It's a group that we've identified positively, and we want to be like them. We want to be accepted by the group, so we start talking like them, acting like them, dressing like them, hanging around these people. But that's really what the anticipatory uh, socialization kind of refers to. All right, um, childhood. Um, our book has a section there that shows that you know for a long time in history. Children were seen as just many adults. There was not a special time in life uh, like we know it today as childhood. So we're talking really about the first 12 years of life. And children were expected to do a lot of adult things. And our book has a picture on 130, page 132 where uh, children are with an adult. And they are they look like many, many adults, many me's uh, that you might remember years ago from a, a movie with Mike Myers there. But they were uh, kind of joking in that movie. Now we do, for the last about 150 uh, to 200 years, have, do have a, a separate phase of life called childhood where we just think differently. Uh, children don't work, adult jobs, uh, they're not dressed like adults, they're considered innocent, they should be uh, developing and playing and not doing adult things, but that's relatively new that our, our book mentions. And then there still are, you know, some children out there whose life is uh, like it has been in the past, uh, but a lot of children have experienced something uh, completely different. Uh, Felipe, Felipe Aries is a researcher there that actually did uh, some research into this topic. I don't believe he is mentioned in our book, but uh, just shows how childhood has been viewed for hundreds of years in the past and then compared to today. And then adolescence is next, but uh, you're kind of in that in-between zone. Uh, it is not a child anymore, not yet an adult, and but yet there's some inconsistencies that happen. So, for example, uh, you're, you can go out and fight for your country and die, but not yet drink alcohol or rent a hotel room. Uh, you know, mentioned how media is very sexually inundated messages are out there but yet uh, until you're you know an adult you're told uh, not to engage in those adult-like behaviors that could uh, lead to reproduction so that's what I mean by some of the inconsistencies in adolescence and again maybe the the issue is also partly like with childhood and this period of innocence but uh, adolescence and teenage all these words are on this graph, and you can kind of see how they were never used at some time in um, history, dated history, recorded history there. And then now, all of a sudden, they just seem to be used quite a bit. Now, this is still a small usage there uh, that the word, these different words appear in books. But you can see almost like the graph just says, well, hey, it just came a time where these words exploded onto the scene. 
As we keep moving on through socialization through the live course, we're going to cover adulthood, aging and retirement, and then some events that have happened that really just mark one generation, distinguish one generation from another. And so our graph here just shows uh, at one point when people reached uh, the age 65 or over, they just really retired and dropped out of the workforce. And that happened from about, according to our graph, from 48, 1948 to 1985. But since then, it seems like there are more people who are working longer. Um, they just prefer to do that, or maybe they have an economic need. Uh, but at any rate, that seems to be the pattern now. Our book uh, moves on and looks at uh, a topic I'm sure that you have certainly um, heard before, but that was the, the nature versus nurture. And so it's really the idea of how much of your behavior is determined by genetics. That would be the nature. And then how much is determined by the environment or the nurture. And maybe other ways to say this are the other two terms on the slide, the biological determinism and then the social determinism. And this is really kind of an interesting concept to think of. I think most of the textbooks I've ever seen really uh, mention about 50-50. Each is worth about 50% uh, percent of what goes on. Um, there are some differences there, but uh, they are the two big determinants of behavior. And uh, our book does have a, a, a good point. You know, uh, if you think that most of everything is biologically determined, then why would we have uh, things like prisons or total institutions to try to correct behavior? So to me, I would say that our society has determined really that uh, most of our behavior is socially determined. You do have control, and that's why uh, these, these institutions could reshape behavior that really doesn't appear uh, as it should. All right, so uh, that is really a fascinating idea to think about. Uh, along those lines, you can have epigenetics. And here the idea is you may have uh, some genes that are responsible in their expression for uh, when they come out, but that is also uh, dependent upon the physical and social environment that a person finds themselves. So sometimes they may be expressed and sometimes they may not be expressed. It's kind of like a light switch. Think of it in those terms. But... Uh, You've got many rooms in your house or uh, a classroom where you can turn on that light or not. And then uh, once you have a lighting, for example, that may change, uh, you know, your ability to get around depending on how light or dark it was when you turned the lights on or, or some other factors. Our book, for example, gives uh, you know, a, a case related to that to help explain what they mean by epigenetics. And saying, well, hey, you know, most humans have a gene for obesity, but for the longest time in human history, it was never switched on because people struggled to get enough uh, food to eat and be nourished. And only, you know, recently now do we have an abundance of food uh, that, like epigenetics says, the light switch for, you know, gaining weight and uh, keeping that weight on has been flipped on. And, uh, you know, we do have high rates of obesity now in the United States. Uh, another example really uses uh, a gene for aggressiveness in men and it was really turned on depending on whether they were abused as, as young children. And then maybe a third and final example uh, shows a current crisis in Flint, Michigan where uh, the city decided to save money and use a, a dirty water source instead of one that was cleaner but cost more money but yet uh, you really didn't have the problems unless you drank the polluted water. And then it, you know, in essence, again, turned a light switch on in your body and then, you know, problems resulted. All right, as we move on here, we have a short uh, section. Uh, what about humans without culture? The way of life. Now, this kind of ties back to our chapter four. Uh, but uh, you can make a good argument as to whether you know animals have culture or not. There's certainly some uh, individual examples where it appears that way, but uh, with all people, they, they do have culture. So uh, animals, since they don't really have culture, they would operate on instinct, and I would argue that uh, humans do not have instinct because they are rather so complex. Now, that there's a lot of people who would 
uh, disagree with that and can point out some different instincts, but uh, that that's okay either way you want to view it. Uh, our book just shows a young lady that didn't develop uh, culture. Her name was Isabel. This was a long time ago uh, in Ohio in the 1930s, and uh, she just, nobody took the time to interact with her, and so she more or less was like an animal, uh, and she her only problem was that she just didn't get the experience that most of us have gotten and maybe we take for granted. So we uh, do owe a debt of gratitude to our parents and others who took care of us and helped to bring out the abilities to now that we uh, take for granted. Now, for fortunately for Isabel, she was uh, taken and got some help and then she was able to make up for um, her deprived environment for years before. Now, our book doesn't mention it, but we can also talk about feral children, feral children, F-E-R-A-L. And these are children who were raised by animals instead of people. And they were much like Isabel. Uh, you can probably think of the Tarzan movie, but uh, he was raised by apes. And there's just been, you know, a handful of these occurrences over years in different countries. And they're just sad stories. And they don't really turn out like Isabel. Usually they would develop some skills, but not really ever fully develop. So it does also bring into view critical periods and how much deprivation is too much before you, you just can't overcome it. We do have some other theories in the chapter, and the first one we come to is Charles Horton Cooley and his theory of the looking glass self. That's just a way um, to talk about a mirror. He was a um, little bit older fella. And so at that time, they called mirrors looking glass, and that's why it has the name it does. Now, what Cooley says, he's really saying, is that our sense of self is really a, uh, influenced by what others think about us. And that's, uh, to me, a unique idea as well. And so you can see the three points he makes on the slide that are also in the textbook, that we imagine ourselves as how we appear to others. We imagine these people making some sort of judgment or judgments about us. And then that judgment that they make affects us. So we either uh, either accept it or reject it. And uh, that's really how we develop a sense of self, according to Cooley. So very short and sweet, nothing uh, a whole, whole very complicated about it. The next theory is by George Herbert Mead. And his theory is a little more complicated or a little more explanation needed. But he talked about the I and me. Now, Cooley and Mead were familiar with one another. With George Herbert Mead's I, he just meant the part of his self that really, for example, if something's ever slipped out that you were thinking but you really didn't want to say, uh, maybe it was perceived as uh, critical of somebody else. Uh, it's like our slide says, it's spontaneous, it's impulsive, it's unpredictable. That's what uh, Mead meant. When he talked about uh, the I. All right, uh, you may call it a Freudian slip. You know, that might be another way to talk about it, but it's something that you're thinking that you didn't really want to say out loud, but yet it comes out. Mead uh, meant by me the part of yourself that uh, recognizes there's some things you can say and some things you can't, but uh, the rules that you need in order to talk with others and have a nice uh, interaction with them. That's what he meant by me. So that's really the difference uh, between the two. Now, he also goes on to say there are different stages in the development of self. And the pre-play stage is uh, about through age two, but children are able to step outside themselves, uh, but yet they're not experts at taking the other position uh, of someone else. They really can't have that uh, concept of what they're thinking in their minds. The second stage that Mead talked about is the play stage, and that starts around age three, but now they start to take on other roles in a very meaningful way. So in their play activities, they may be a mom or a dad or some other role that they want to play with. The third stage for Mead is the game stage, and now we're up to about age six or seven. And children now are getting better and better, but they not only know how to play a role, but they know how, for example, this role uh, links up to other roles, how they might be related. So uh, they could play team sports or games that require cooperation. Uh, they would also know, for example, 
uh, when this this process of a, a game doesn't go right. So if you heard somebody upset that cheating was going on, uh, that would be something you would expect. And then finally, the last stage that we talked about was the generalized other, and um, this would be beyond that age uh, six and seven, maybe out to ten or, or even out to twelve. But here, uh, they children really have started to internalize the rules that they have been taught. And again, they know whether things uh, are right uh, or maybe can guess what others now would be thinking given a certain situation. So uh, if they had a friend whose pet died, they could understand that their friend might be sad uh, and how to probably console them. All right, so two good theories. As we move on here, we come to a section of uh, neurosociology and then... Uh, Michel Foucault's regimes of power that we have also uh, seen before, but kind of tailored to this chapter. But neurosociology, for example, our, our book just mentions uh, it's just a field that studies uh, the nervous system, uh, central nervous system, and in particular the brain, uh, but trying to find out more about um, how that operates and how uh, certain uh, chemicals or other things, neurotransmitters or hormones, uh, might have uh, impact upon our behavior. Uh, also, for example, the, the this section mentions the brain plasticity, and that's the remarkable ability that the brain has uh, to restructure and reorganize itself. And not only, I guess a lot of times you may hear this in injury, but uh, not really so much in this case for us in the chapter, but really because of social experiences and learning. So, uh, you know, when we are learning different things, literally our brain is being restructured according uh, to this field and, and this study. Now, uh, an example of that our book gives us is uh, there the left-hand side at the top on page 143, but it talks about the brain specialization. For example, the left side being associated with language and logic and things like that. But the right side uh, would be associated with uh, well-being and, and uh, reasoning of a, of a non-kind of linear logical sort. Uh, but it just mentions a group of children uh, there that in their society they relied on the right-hand side of the brain. But then uh, when they moved to a different area, a different culture where people really relied on the left side of the brain because of brain plasticity, they were able uh, to adapt to that new condition. So that's a rather remarkable condition. Uh, in terms of injury, if you have taken psychology, you may remember Phineas Gage, but uh, there his personality kind of went from Jekyll to Hyde, from day to night, uh, but again shows that uh, brain plasticity at play kind of in a different way. All right, but uh, we've looked at power before. Um, we've got a French sociologist here that we um, had seen in a previous chapter, but uh, he really talks about um, the social situation of power and how that can influence, again, the situations we find ourselves and the behaviors that are expected from us. The final thing in Chapter 6, uh, just something you're very aware of, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure many of you may have social media accounts. I'm a little slow in that, but um, our book just mentions the world of, of digital identity and the digital world and how you can uh, often use that for a lot of positive things and maybe there's some negative consequences as well, uh, but there's uh, just a short discussion on that and maybe some different platforms that one could use. And then maybe some of those negative things is, hey, you still have uh, bullying and and things of that that uh, can lead to some bad consequences for, for some people if it's not correctly monitored. Uh, we're at the end of the chapter. We have some additional slides, but uh, you can uh, look at those for yourself if you wish. They're all in Blackboard and freely available all the time. But if I can help you further, please contact me, and I hope you have a good day. Thank you.